Hey, Dr. C here with you. So this is the Testing Your Thyroid Definitive Guide. This is everything you'd want to know about thyroid tests. And super important topic, you know, thyroid disease is a big deal. This is the leading cause of people going to pharmacies worldwide, pretty much the top one to two or three leading causes. Thyroid disease is the most common of all autoimmune diseases, and thyroid cancer is the most rapidly increasing type of cancer. And the questions are, is this affecting you? You know, is your thyroid the cause of symptoms? Or if you know that it is, are you on the best treatments available? And this is a case to where labs are essential. You only know this by testing. You got to test and not guess. Now, the goal is to improve your symptoms, but the problem is that the symptoms are not specific. You can have the same symptoms from too little, too much thyroid hormone, thyroid autoimmunity, or something else altogether. And it's critical to understand which tests are best, what they all mean, and this video will help explain all of that to you. And it's important stuff because many of them realize that if they rely on their doctors only, they may not get the most thorough tests, or they may not look at the tests in the most meaningful ranges. So we'll dive deep into Thyroid 101, you know, what the gland is, what it does, what all these T, funny T names are all about, and we'll get deep into the tests, which ones you need, what should you get done, and how should they look? One thing I like to say at the very gate is that I hear the question a lot, uh, what should I ask my doctor to test? And before you go too much further, there's a presupposition in that question. And the presupposition is that if your doctor will order the test that you ask, everything will be okay. Well, you need to get the right tests, yes, but your doctor is not just someone to order the tests for you. You know, there's someone to help interpret them and interpret them in the context of your larger health, your bigger health history, your family history, your psychological health, your social health, all this stuff, and help sort out best treatments and best directions for you. You can order your own labs pretty much anywhere. So don't think that you need your doctor just for those purposes, but it's good to have someone you can trust to help answer a lot of those other questions. And here's the thing, even if you can find a lot of the information online, it's good to have someone outside of yourself to be objective. You know, those of us in the medical profession, we practice that by and large and we're taught that. We, the, the saying is that the, the doctor with himself for a patient has a fool for a patient. <laughs> and it's true, I don't do manage my own care. So we want someone outside of us and ideally someone who knows in depth about the thing we're concerned about. So don't just think about the doctor's rubber stamp. If you've got a doctor who doesn't know which test to order, that's an action step. <laughs> you've got to find a doctor who knows about these things and can help help and guide you. So thyroid 101, the thyroid is part of the whole endocrine system. And the oversight of that is done by the brain. Uh, the brain has a couple little glands called the hypothalamus and the pituitary. These things manage over 9,000 chemical reactions in the body and they're all interconnected. You know, no one of them is more important than the others, and they all work together. They do that by managing a series of glands outside of themselves, and that includes the thyroid, the adrenals, the ovaries, the testicles, pancreas, the pineal gland, and among a few more minor ones. But the general idea is that these glands regulate different facets of the body's chemistry. Now, the thyroid is it's a little different than the others. The main thing is that every cell in your body has thyroid hormone receptors. Now a receptor is just kind of like a kind of like a key and a key that will fit with a lock. So hormones can be thought of more so as these particular keys and receptors can be thought of more so as the locks. And many hormones work on receptors that are specific to them only and they're in particular parts of your body. You know, a simple example could be estrogen acting on estrogen receptors in the uterus and preparing the uterus for implantation. Now, the thyroid hormones are everywhere. That's not true of all hormones. Most don't have receptors in all cells, but thyroid hormones do. Thyroid hormones also play a role in affecting other cells and how, how these other cells act on different hormones. So thyroid hormones affect non-thyroid hormones. That's one way in which they're different. The general idea, though, is that thyroid hormones affect the rate of metabolic rate you know, how quickly we convert fuel into energy within our cells. So that's both energy slash fatigue, but also body weight. You know, those things are two sides of the same coin. The other big thing your thyroid's regulating is the rate of protein synthesis. How quickly your body makes certain proteins, how quickly you repair your tissues. 
And that's relevant to the hair, skin, and nails. If you're not repairing these things well, they become unhealthy, more thin and more dry. And your thyroid also controls the rate of neurologic reactions, you know, how quickly nerve impulses spread throughout your body. A direct example of that is how your brain works, you know, whether your short-term memory is good or not so much. Also mood, um, energy, enthusiasm, ambition, and then things like nerve conduction. You know, if your thyroid hormones are off, you can't really use your hands properly. You can have tremors or movement disorders when they're off by large amounts. And that's not just the hands. One more big way that's relevant is the intestinal tract. The gut is a whole long series of nerves. And if nerve conduction rates aren't healthy, then we have a big range of digestive problems from uh, poor digestion to irritable bowel syndrome to things called leaky gut syndrome, you know, constipation, diarrhea. And they can all tie to this neurologic side of the thyroid hormones. So now let's talk about the main things that can become part of the tests, the main T numbers. First thing to think about would be the TSH. And this is the signal from the pituitary telling the thyroid to work. This is thyroid stimulating hormone. A couple of big things to know about it. First is that it's backwards. So when there's too much thyroid hormone, the TSH goes below range. And that's the first thing that happens when there's too much thyroid hormone. That's an important point. If there's too little thyroid hormone, the TSH gets higher, like a lot higher. And when it's a little bit high, it's pushing the thyroid harder, but the thyroid may still be working. Finally, if the thyroid can't work, then the TSH is really high and the measurable hormones coming out of the thyroid are badly low. Now, the first one of those is called T4, and T refers to thyroglobulin. This is a protein made from tyrosine, and it's kind of like a little template onto which iodine atoms are stuck, like in the right spots. When you get a little portion of this thyroid protein moiety with four iodine atoms, that's T4, and that's what the four number means. Most of what your thyroid makes is T4, and T4, it does things by itself, and it's a source for T3. So your body pulls off an iodine atom and can convert T4 into T3 as needed. Kind of like pulling the pin out of a grenade, but not that it's that out of control, but yes, it's like that. You take something out and it becomes different. Now, some talk about T4 is only really existing just to make T3. And if that were the case, why not just take T3 and be done with it? Well, that's not the case. We know many examples to where T4 does things that T3 cannot do, that the body requires. For example, the release of thyroid hormone across the blood-brain barrier into the brain is preferential for T4. And it's exclusive for T4 crossing the placenta into a fetus. So yeah, so if mom only had T3 in some weird way, like if she were only on T3 meds, she could have plenty of thyroid hormone for parts of her body, but the baby could have none. So there's other examples as well, and there's different receptors throughout the body for T4 and T3, different genes respond to them. So we need both, and we make both. You know, So when the body makes something, it needs it, and we need it in certain proportions. Uh, T3 is next up, and this one is also made directly by the thyroid, and it's also converted from T4. So it comes from those two different sources. Now, there's a lot of other things like T4 and like T3. You know, T2 is one of them. And these are all called thyronamines. They're all thyroid metabolically active proteins. There's upwards of a dozen and a half of them that we're aware of. Right now, we're focusing on thyroid labs. We can measure T3 and T4, just those two. Uh, there's two different ways they can be measured. So they can be measured in terms of how much is there of them altogether or just how much of the active fraction of them is there. It's called the free portion. So with T4 and T3, you can measure total T4 or free T4. Now, total T4 might just be called T4. So if it just says T4, that means total T4. The relevance is that a small subset of T4 is more active. It's not bound up with carrier proteins. Total T4 measures that active fraction and the less active, larger amount altogether. That's why it's called total. Now, free T4 is preferred. There's, there's no cost disadvantage. The tech can do it just fine. And there are many cases to where the amount of free T4 you wouldn't predict based upon the total T4. 
people can have pretty erratic amounts of carrier proteins, and that can change the amount of active T4. So free T4 is preferred. And on a lab order, that can be called just lowercase f, capital T, and then number four quite commonly. So let's talk about T3 briefly in terms of blood tests. That same thing about T4 is largely true for T3, with the exception of the problem that free T3 is so minuscule, it's close to the edge of our accuracy for measuring. So there's two conflicting concerns, one of which is whether we're measuring the active fraction or the total fraction, but the other one is whether we're measuring it accurately at all. And the inaccuracy of measuring things in such small quantities for free T3 becomes a little more relevant than the difference between free T3 and total T3. Now, this is not a huge distinction, and free T3 is not a bad test, but there is a slight advantage to total T3 at this time. I'm recording this in 2024. Future technology may allow versions of free T3 that are more accurate than they are at present, but as of right now, total T3 is a bit more useful than free T3. The T3 and T4, a really important point to understand about them is that we measure them, but what we're seeing is not what's coming out of the thyroid, nor is it what's entering the bloodstream when someone is taking medication. What we're measuring is what the body has in the bloodstream after it's done a lot of things to make the blood levels where it wants it. So they're highly buffered. You know, a little comparison, we can measure serum levels of calcium. And sometimes they're off, it's super important. But serum calcium is not a direct reflection of calcium intake. So if you have, you know, an extra glass of milk or more or less calcium supplements, these things don't cause your serum calcium to go up and down. When they do go up and down, it means your body cannot regulate serum calcium. It's the exact same story with T4 and T3 in thyroid blood tests. And so many don't understand that. I'm glad that you're going to be able to. When they change, barring the most extreme excess or deficiency, when those things go up and down a bit, it's not because you're consuming too little or too much if you're on medication. It also doesn't mean your body is making too little or too much. It means that you're regulating it in that particular way. And your body's doing the best that it can given all 9,000 chemical pathways in their current configuration. So it's doing it for a reason, and there might be problems, there might be things that are off. But micromanaging T3 and T4 with medications is a real big misunderstanding. It's like trying to micromanage serum calcium by consuming more or less calcium when that's just not what's happening. So yeah, those are T3 and T4. With a TSH, we hear a lot about normal versus optimal values. And there is a difference to be made, but the relevance is what is the context of that difference. Now, normal ranges most say is between about 0.4 to 4.5, and that's where most people fall in a given population. But healthier people, healthier adults between uh, later teens, like young adults, and older adults, uh, mid-50s, mid-60s, somewhere in there, non-pregnant, uh, no other medical issues, generally have low normal TSH scores, meaning between about 0.5 and 2, most typically. So if someone is not in that range, it is possible there's something that's affecting their thyroid. Totally true. And it could be causing symptoms for them. But here's an issue. Many then think, oh, that means they need thyroid medication. The one doesn't follow from the other. You know, there's times in where something could be affecting your thyroid, but you're not simply out of thyroid hormone. And thyroid medication wouldn't be of benefit for you. And that's the first big distinction to make about normal versus optimal. So yes, TSH optimal is low normal for most people, but it doesn't mean you need medication if you're not there. Now, if you are on thyroid medication and you need it long-term, so you're lacking a thyroid, it may well be the case that you feel better when your dose is such that makes your TSH low normal. That's totally fine. There's no big drawback to that. But if you're on medication and feeling well, you don't have to have your TSH low normal. So you wouldn't say, oh, my TSH is three, everything is great, I've got to change my medicine. No. Yeah, the one application is that it's an optional thing for those who do need medication. If you are on medicine and you don't need it, the solution might not be pushing your TSH down. If you do need it, it could be. And if you're not on medication, that's not a reason to start medication. Now, because a low normal TSH is more optimal, many have assumed that a high normal T3 and T4 must be optimal. And this is a tough situation. There are people to where 
if they're given medication, especially medicine they might not need, they may feel better short term in some ways if they're taking a little more than their body really wants. You know, they could be tired or run down for any number of reasons, and a slight overdose on thyroid might temporarily lower some of their fatigue symptoms. But it doesn't mean it's making them healthier. It doesn't mean that it's safe. Now, if someone's given medication, you really can't push their T3 or T4 to high normal without giving them an overdose. And the first signs of that are the TSH going below range. So when we look at populations of people who have high normal T3 and T4 within range, they're not healthy people. They've got higher rates of breast cancer, higher rates of diabetes, and other health problems. So I don't really see that that goal makes sense. I can understand why someone would think that it would, but looking at it more deeply, it just doesn't really pan out. So yeah, the, the first question really, if you're on medicine and not feeling your best, it's not about micromanaging T3 and T4. It's first and foremost about asking whether you need medication. So many people who are on medication, they simply don't need it based on our most current guidelines. They're in a situation in which the medicine may not be helping them, and paradoxically, it can cause them to have symptoms like they had too little thyroid hormone. And that can be true regardless of where their blood levels are. So that's a much, much bigger issue than micromanaging levels of T3 and T4. So with thyroid tests, then we also think about, first and foremost, what are the hormones that are related to the thyroid, the TSH, T3, and T4, but then also what is occurring with inflammation of the thyroid. And this is where thyroid autoimmunity comes into, into bear. And this is such an important topic. You know, in almost all cases, people who are symptomatic are symptomatic more so because of thyroid autoimmunity and less so because of a lack of thyroid hormone. So the take home point here is that if you've got thyroid disease, you've got to check thyroid antibodies. The main two here are antithyroglobulin and antithyroid peroxidase. There's a couple others that come up with other versions of thyroid disease. I won't go into those right now, but those two are critical. So if you're struggling with thyroid symptoms, whether you're on medication or not, be sure that antibodies are part of your testing. And there are safe ways to help antibodies. Now, if your doctor isn't on board with testing your antibodies, what that means is they don't know that your antibodies are important, and they don't know safe ways to help your antibodies. So this goes back to the prior point about you want a doctor who knows these things. You want someone who can guide you in ways that are helpful. So regarding thyroid tests, the big ones to think about are going to be the thyroid function, the thyroid antibodies. Last one I'll mention will be a marker of thyroid structure, a blood marker, and this is called thyroglobulin. A little confusing because there's antithyroglobulin and then thyroglobulin. But thyroglobulin is a protein that's made in the gland and it spills out when thyroid cells die. So it reflects the rate of normal cell turnover. If the gland is really big or if the cells are growing too fast, thyroglobulin may be elevated. That's one that we don't need all the time, but if someone has had thyroid cancer or growth abnormalities, it can be part of the screening as well. But to wrap this up for most people, if the question is, is your thyroid causing problems, you want to get a good screen, and you want that screen to include thyroid antibody levels. And you want to know that if there's something abnormal, that doesn't mean straight away that you need medication. It can be real, it can be affecting you, it can be causing symptoms, but medications may not be the best solution for that. And even if all markers are normal and healthy, but your antibodies are high, that can be the cause of symptoms right there. All right, Dr. C here with you. Uh, this was a deep dive on thyroid labs. Take great care, and we'll talk again really soon. Bye-bye.